Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. Our guest today is Sugata Mitra, who is Professor of Educational Technology at Newcastle University in the UK. Sugata is by training a physicist with over 25 inventions to his name in the area of cognitive science and education technology. He is widely cited in works on literacy and education and is perhaps most well known as a proponent of minimally invasive education and his hole in the wall experiment. He won the 2013 TED Prize for his talk Build a School in a Cloud, after which he used the prize money to set up a number of the cloud schools and conduct research with them, about which I believe the data is now just starting to come in. He's here to talk to us today about learning as being an emergent phenomenon in a self-organising education system, which emerges as spontaneous order at the edge of chaos. We begin the conversation from where Sugata has just asked me to remind him what our understanding of the middle way is and how it might relate to his work. I suppose the idea behind the, the middle way is the idea we make better judgments by uh, avoiding sort of fixed or dogmatic beliefs about things, uh, whether these are positives or negative. Now, that arguably throws us back onto experience, so we're sort of left in this messy, uncertain middle. And, and it's this messy, uncertain middle it, that's the place where you actually start to get to grips more radically with the phenomena that we encounter. I was wondering, you know, this could this messy, uncertain middle in some way be be the edge of chaos that you're that you're talking about? Okay, yeah, uh, I, I remember that now. Uh, so, what are the two ends that you're talking about? Well, the two ends are um, any sort of fixed belief. So, it could be, for example. In terms of religion, you'd be atheism as opposed to theism, or it could be free will as opposed to determinism. It's when when you take anything really in absolute terms, but they often have a, a negative absolute as well, which often people don't recognise. Like for example, scepticism. You know, it's the recognition that you may not know. Someone could take that in absolute terms, going the other way and thinking, well, I know absolutely nothing. Yeah. And um, so then you've got nihilism and relativism as well. But it's also important, often there's, there's things of real value uh, when you avoid the extremes. So the sort of middle way inside out in many ways is integration. It's reconciling opposing beliefs and finding what's good. And again, I see that your approach is working in that, as you call it, the edge of chaos. The two extremes for you are order and chaos, and it's finding that balance between the two. And often, you know, that's where creativity occurs. Yes, I mean, that seems to be, by and large, how nature seems to operate, you know, uh, at, at a very uh, thin boundary between uh, two extremes. And uh, all the interesting stuff seems to happen in that, uh, in that thin boundary. The work itself seems to, uh, you know, keep on taking these unexpected uh, turns. Um, maybe because of the fact that uh, while I'm doing the work, the information infrastructure is also changing. It's only now that I realize that between the time that I initially did the hole in the wall experiment and uh, now, uh, the, the the whole world itself has also changed a lot. So if I say that I've just noticed something new, it doesn't necessarily mean that there was something to be noticed and I just noticed it. It could also be that what I noticed has happened or has become noticeable only now, which kind of confuses the whole issue. So anyway, uh, I'm now kind of interested in uh, in a in a kind of a a thought experiment, if you like, that yeah. um, if we were to consider ourselves as a composite creature, uh, half human and half phone, then what would you say that uh, composite creature knows? For example, if, uh, if I can point my phone at a piece of uh, French text, 
and it reads it out to me in English, then would you say that I can read French? I asked this to an audience quite recently and uh, they said, no, you don't know how to read French. You're, you're using your phone to read French. But then I said, but uh, imagine for a moment that my phone and I are actually composite. We, we are not two separate things. We, we are joined together. I very much agree that we are. I really like this term emergence. And I think that um, relates very much to learning or even to our mind itself. Of this whole notion of mutual causality, you know, like, for example, with the hummingbird. What formed the hummingbird's beak? Was it the, the shape of the, the, the flower? Or was it the big? You can't separate the two. They're, they're, they're mutually causal. And I think that relates to what you're saying about what's happening with your work. But also, an early hominid creature was called Homo habilis, tool making man. And, you know, when we're in a car, when you're reversing, when, when you get used to that car, that, that car becomes in many ways a part, a part of your body. Yes. Or when you're using a hammer, then that's an extension of many, in many ways of your own consciousness. So, as you say about using mobile phones to translate or Google to store memories for you. Yes, definitely. But my current view of the brain is that that it is uh, it, it's actually quite a lot more complex than we think it is. So I would say that uh, a brain remembers what it wants to remember. And we don't quite know why it remembers what it remembers. Yeah. <laughs> so so it is possible that on the one hand, we leave a, a, a lot of stuff to uh, our uh, exobiological friends, computers to remember for us. And let's say that uh, Google has told us, you know, hundreds and hundreds of different things uh, out of the whole lot. Uh, it's entirely possible that our brain, for some reason, has retained the fact that there is an elastic belt available at Marks and Spencer for 1995. Out of all the enormous amounts of philosophical data, etc., that we collected, our brain has decided that this is what it wishes to remember. Yeah. We don't know why it does that. And sometimes it would remember <laughs> this endlessly. And it's possible that by the time I'm like 80 years old and you say, what do you remember about 2016? I might just say, you know, uh, there's a there's a jumper in Marks and Spencer that I remember. Mm. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Why why that happens is uh, I think by and large unknown. And different people have tried different ways to explain it, but I haven't yet actually found an explanation. Now, why am I saying this? Is because in that case, trying to make a brain remember certain things and not remember other things is a futile exercise, according to me. You know, uh, a number of uh, my uh, teachers uh, tried their very best uh, to make me remember the 17 times tables. Uh, they succeeded to a large extent, but I think beyond 17 into 5, I don't actually remember what the other sequence is. Mm. So... Was it worthwhile they're trying to teach me the times tables for, for so many years? Or is it that if I had never ever studied the times tables, then at a certain, at this point in my time, uh, in my life, if you had asked me, do you remember any multiplication in your mind at all? I might have actually told you quite a few that my brain has decided that it will remember. Mm. We don't know why. So why I want to emphasize the fact that this view that some people have that looking up things on the Internet continuously makes us into some kind of a moron who doesn't actually know anything is entirely incorrect. I think that if we do it, if we do that, you know, 24 by 7, as most of us are doing, our brains are actually keeping stuff inside things that it considers important. It's just that we don't know why it thinks those things are important. There is a, a big movement against that in the sense that people are concerned that people are living very distractive lives uh, because they're losing the ability to 
focus for even a, a limited time. But you're saying that that's not necessarily a bad thing. Exactly. That, uh, you know, there is no need to assume that a shorter attention span is worse than a longer attention span. In fact, it's entirely possible that a person staring fixedly at something for hours on end could actually uh, be demonstrating a pretty low level of intelligence, as opposed to the guy who is uh, constantly focusing and defocusing on all kinds of other things. So labeling one of them as high attention span and another one as low attention span and then making a value judgment about which is right and which is wrong is making assumptions about the human brain, uh, which we don't know anything about. But then how do you, with that mindset, ever really uh, knuckle down and learn a skill, like, for example, learning to play football or learning to um, be an artist? What about the whole concept of the 10,000 hours that, you know, you know, in order to acquire a skill, it, it needs a lot of effort and application? Maybe in that way you can acquire a wide variety of skills, but can you ever acquire a good one? Or is that, is that not a bad thing? Is that what you're saying? No, it's not a question of a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, I, I think that, for example, uh, if you had a tiger chasing you, then you would learn how to climb a tree really quickly. <laughs> you know, it's a skill that you would acquire uh, extremely quickly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, for, for any skill that you need to have, I think it's not so much a question of 10,000 hours. It's a question of what's the tiger that's chasing you? And for different artists and, and different, um, you know, people who are highly skilled, I think if we look back at their lives, we can always identify a tiger that was doing the whole thing. And, and, and that's how the skill came. Of course, they had to practice. Of course, they had to make themselves better and so on and so forth. But I don't think that uh, without the tiger, you would find climbing a tree a particularly important or uh, interesting activity so what was your tiger uh, when you were a young man when you pursued the the field of physics yeah my tiger was uncertainty and uh, you know when i bumped into in the latter part of my schooling when they suddenly said that what we had been teaching you all these years about newton well things are not really exactly like that you know uh, things are much more probabilistic uh, than deterministic and uh, that became my tiger really and was that the the catalyst for you starting to challenge the whole idea of the education system and school because the main premise of your your latter work in the last 15 20 years is that the school system is is obsolete is no longer fit for purpose yeah, well, no, I, I, I would not relate those two things at all, uh, okay. except in a very roundabout way. I think this is a very important uh, question that you've asked me. The whole issue of education is something that I bumped into very accidentally because of that one single experiment. And people ask me, why did you do that experiment? And my answer is, uh, I you know, it wasn't a flash of insight or anything fantastic like that. It was just something that could be done. You know, you look at children and, and you look at yourself and you say, I've got computers. I play with computers. My son has access to my computers. What if these children also had access? What would happen? That's all. So it was just that question. Um, what actually happened at that time was also not, you know, uh, earth shaking. It was that children fiddling around with a computer can figure out how to use it. So at that time, uh, I, I said, well, that, that's fine. I mean, maybe we should have, we should have been able to guess that uh, even without doing the experiment. Then they started answering questions using the mm -hmm. internet. And then I started to get confused because when it was simple questions, uh, I said, OK, that's fine. The Internet is there and they're finding an answer. Then I started asking questions to which nobody knows the answer. And then they started saying some very sensible things and they were really little children. That's when I began to suspect that there is a new mechanism at work here 
which I don't know anything about. Mm-hmm. And I turned to my old subject, physics, and particularly the the uh, the uncertain and the complex areas that physics deals with nowadays. You know, uh, complex not as in complicated, but you know, complex has a very specific meaning in physics. Uh, I looked at those and said, well, uh, they they seem to be similar to what I'm observing with children. Then I started looking at swarms and insects and hives. And then I found, well, that seems to be also similar to what I find uh, with groups of children and the Internet. And then the whole thing became very, very different from a few children tinkering around with a computer on a street. Then I started to imagine the human race uh, beginning to self-organize because of uh, intense connectivity. Um, I, I tested it out on children by asking them to find out. I said, you know, can you check out what the Internet is? Uh, to a group of nine-year-olds in uh, County Durham in England. And they worked on it for some time. And then there was this shrill voice from a little girl who said, my God, it's like a gigantic brain. <laughs> so so I said, really? Uh, do you think it's like a brain? She said, yes, it's got interconnected parts. And that's what brains have, etc., etc." cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's what children, I've seen children do this when they work in groups in what are called self-organized learning environments. Uh, and I think many teachers have now also. But anyway, so, so this is what they said. So then just to be cussed, I said, well, if it's, a, if it's a gigantic brain, does it think? And the children went really silent. <laughs> and, and then they started to sort of, you know, work on it on their own and mutter and discuss and, Etc. And said, no, we, we don't think it thinks. I mean, we human beings think and the Internet is all joined up together as a as a huge group. But no, it doesn't think. And then I uh, then I asked them, but when you're doing this self-organized learning environment, are you doing the thinking or is the group doing the thinking? And they said the group, you know, the children. They said, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the group's doing the thinking. And I said, but the group doesn't, I mean, the group is not a thing. The group is a group. I mean, it's just, it's, it's not, <laughs> you know, so, so it got really complex. But the children loved that interaction because I think it's their world. And they saw a certain sense in this whole idea that the Internet was like a gigantic thinking thing. That just makes me think of something. In a, a couple of weeks, I'm... Uh... I'm interviewing a psychologist called Daniel Siegel and just re- relating to some of the concepts that you're bringing about learning, that it's relational, that it's an emergent thing, that it's self-organizing. Um, he's been working for many years with a large number of colleagues from a, a wide range of disciplines on trying to find a working definition for the mind. And it's people from physics, from sociology, from psychology. And that's been a real challenge to actually find a definition which everyone can sort of agree on. Anyway, they've come up with this one where he describes it as being an embodied and a relational, emergent, self-organizing process that regulates energy and information. Now, that sounds very similar to what you and what you just said there and what those kids discovered for themselves as well. Yeah. Well, yes, I, I would tend to agree with that kind of a definition that that the mind is a is a is some in some way an emergent phenomenon. And and uh, you know the the I, I often do this with uh, engineering students just to explain to them uh, what emergent uh, things are. I sometimes ask them that uh, would you agree that the internet exists? And that's a stupid question because obviously everybody says, yes, it does. And then I say, well, you know, I agree that it does. In which case, my second question is, where is it? And now everybody's silent. (laughs) So I say that, do you mean to say that all these years of engineering, we've managed to actually produce something which exists, but doesn't have any spatial existence, doesn't exist anywhere. It just exists. And... Is that the reason why, while in engineering drawing, 
everything is drawn literally. When it comes to drawing the internet, they draw a picture of a cloud. Mm. Um, so what does that mean? That a hard-headed subject like engineering has landed itself with some immaterial, emergent, invisible thing that undoubtedly exists. Isn't that also our definition of consciousness? So then we actually ended up creating it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, and uh, while I'm uh, not at all a religious person, I uh, cannot help but remember a line which uh, many Indian children have, uh, have bumped into without understanding anything about it. It's just three words from a very old uh, Hindu text which says, Thou art that. And we said, what does that mean? I mean, you are that. What's that? <laughs> that <laughs> but but uh, this discussion with the engineering students sometimes uh, sort of brings that those three words to my mind to say, <laughs> to say that, you know, it's sort of everywhere, but it's nowhere. It exists, but it doesn't exist and, and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so if that is what the mind is, if that is what uh, uh, consciousness is, then it's actually not very hard to create. And it probably is everywhere, which probably means that a beehive is actually conscious as a beehive, not individual bees inside it, but the yeah. hive itself is conscious. Uh, almost anything in nature is self-organizing, including ourselves, including bacteria, including viruses, uh, including the universe. So, so why would we be surprised if learning itself was an, uh, an uh, example of emergent uh, phenomenon? Sure, yeah. You know, so, yeah, uh, so I just wanted to add one more thing to that. Uh, another thing that I, uh, that has been sort of going through my mind uh, quite a lot in recent times, which is this whole issue of causality. Now, causality is uh, asymmetric in time. You know, we, we say that the, the cause comes first and the effect follows. So it's kind of unidirectional in time. Now, just for the heck of it, just for fun, could we imagine time symmetric causality where the cause can exist either in the past or in the future? And suddenly I find, but our minds are exactly like that. Everything we do is because of the past and because of the future at the same time. If you get up from your chair, it's because you know what's going to happen when you get up from your chair. Uh, it's, uh, so when we say I want, you're actually referring to a cause that exists in the future. So could it be as simple as that, that what we're missing out here is that we have looked at a certain important part of reality, which is causality, as time asymmetric, whereas we should have looked at it as time symmetric. OK, so how could you actually apply that in, in terms of the future of learning with that understanding? How could that help us learn better or live more integrated lives? Um, I did an experiment once, actually, uh, uh, which is all, uh, which is actually published. You might uh, uh, find it interesting. Uh, it, it, uh, it it was an experiment with uh, what's called uh, one-dimensional cellular automata. Uh, these are uh, little computer creatures, basically, uh, that follow a very simple set of rules and uh, and and show. Uh, patterns of behavior and obviously what happens to one of these creatures in the next instant of time depends on what happened to it in the previous instance of time easy enough to simulate and you can you can see it and, it, and it, it's kind of interesting to do lots of people have done it what i did was that i took the future of that one object in a in, in a whole array of connected objects and said that instead of saying that the future is blank, what happens if I put something in its future? Uh, it's possible to do. It's, it's too long to explain on the phone, but it, uh, it's, it's there in the paper. 
what we found was that the entire organism then actualizes what was in its future over and over again. I think the paper is called Fractal uh, Replication in uh, Time Symmetric One-Dimensional Cellular Automata or some such complex thing like that. Uh, so it it was a uh, now what does that mean in in uh, in terms of regular day to day language would be that we constantly have an a picture of the future in our mind and we actualize it over and over again it never comes out exactly the way it existed in our mind or very very seldom but we get close sometimes and sometimes not we are driven by the future more than you're driven by the past. If, if, if I take that as an assumption, then if you apply that to learning, your whole uh, story becomes in a way upside down. You start with things that nobody knows. So then I, and that's what I'm working on right now is that can we define a curriculum of all the big things that we don't know anything about? What are the big questions for our time that nobody knows the answer? Because then the internet is not of much help because if nobody knows the answer, the internet doesn't either. Now there are some theoretical advantages. If I take standard curriculum, which is made up of things that we know, then that can only get longer and longer with time. And that's what teachers keep complaining about. They keep saying, how can I finish all this in one semester? And then 10 years later, then said it's impossible to finish this in one semester because now there's even more. If Curriculum is made up of things that we know. But on the other hand, if the curriculum is made up of the big things that we don't know, then could we say that in principle, such a curriculum will become shorter and shorter with time? That's very interesting, yeah? So so then, where does that get us? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just, just working with it. Yeah. Uh, it also solves another problem of saying that people who look up the internet become mindless. Because then I would say to those people, but they're looking at the internet to try and find things which the internet doesn't actually know anything about and which nobody knows anything about. So they're only looking at the internet to see if they can get clues to a question to which no one has the answer. So your pedagogy then becomes acceptable. So uh, could that give us a, a new new structure of uh, of how learning should be? If you try it with children, I find one thing which is universally true across the world. If you take a group of, let's say, nine or ten year olds and tell them that here is a question to which no one has the answer. I have never found a group that is not intensely interested in it immediately. Yes. This is probably true of adults as well. As soon as you say no one knows the answer, you're talking of a, you know, a late evening pub conversation. <laughs> well, as, he, as I said in many of your interviews, all, all you have to say to a crowd of kids is that, uh, you know, uh, well, I'm not, you're not, I'm not sure you're going to find this answer. Yeah, and that's yeah, a challenge. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if you can't find the answer to this. Well, that's <laughs> the worst thing you can say to 12 year olds. You know, they'll do nothing else. <laughs> so... Yeah. You know, after you won the TED Prize in 2013, you used that money to actually set up the school in the cloud. And you also started with a research project. And uh, you said in one of your interviews, around this time, you should be starting getting that some data back. Have you, has that started to happen yet? Yes, yes. I've got almost all of the data back now. It's not all processed, but uh, it shows a couple of very clear uh, signs, uh, clear results. Uh, first of all, uh, a pretty rapid improvement in reading comprehension, uh, which is natural because, you know, children are, uh, you know, researching, are, are constantly reading things which are way above the official level at which they should be reading. And that seems to improve their reading comprehension. Uh, their ability to communicate uh, complex ideas improves because, again, they're doing it all the time. Their ability to search the Internet improves very noticeably, uh, once again, because uh, they're doing that all the time. In that connection, I should also mention that I cannot imagine why uh, in uh, primary school, children are not taught how to uh, look for things on the Internet. 
It's a skill yeah. that they will use throughout the rest of their lives, 24 by 7. And it's not taught in school. They are expected to learn this uh, hanging around with their friends in the supermarket. Uh, it's, it doesn't make sense. It's crazy, isn't it? No, it doesn't make sense. But uh, just a, a question there. You know, with so much information out there and arguably misinformation too, um, how do self-organizing kids learn to discern and to think critically? Well, uh, you know, first of all, it's not, this is not a new problem. It's not exclusive to the internet. If you walk into any large library, it's also full of absolute rubbish inside yeah. books. Do we all know how to distinguish the rubbish from the real stuff? Well, not often. We could easily make a mistake. What I have learned with, uh, with these experiments uh, with the school in the cloud is that children working in groups, uh, around the internet, are much less likely to come to a wrong conclusion than individual children left alone on their own with either books or the internet or anything. How do you guard against things like bullying and ostracism and uh, or just social loafing that you know, like say in an say if you did this in an exam, um, people just sit back and wait for someone else to sort out the answer? Yes, they they frequently do that. And uh, they do it in various uh, ways. And if you ask them, uh, they also give very accurate and good answers. If you say, why did you not do anything yourself? And why were you waiting for John to figure out the answer? A child might say, because John is much better at figuring out the answer than I am. He does it quickly. And if I just copy down what John has written, then I would get to the right answer quicker and more accurately than if I had tried it myself. Um, I don't have any argument with that, actually. Uh, my, one of my uh, best moments was in a school in Gateshead where uh, I had asked the children they can use anything they wanted. They could talk to each other. They could use the Internet, etc. And a little girl asked, uh, are you sure I can do I can use any method? And I said, yes. And she said, can I call my mom? And. I thought for a moment and then I thought that the answer to that should be yes. Why? Because if you have a problem, if you have a phone and if you have a mum, you should call her. I mean, what's wrong with doing that? So now you might say, but she then really doesn't know the answer. And I get confused because I don't know what really doesn't know means. Yeah. You know, so, okay. so if the important thing is, can you get to the answer to a question, if that's what an examination is about, then uh, I would only check for, did he get to the answer or not? Why would I be interested in how he got to the answer? And I suppose post-school, that is what life these days puts a premium on, to get into that answer as quickly as possible. Yes, and that's what makes you successful in life. And I don't think anybody asks you how you got to the answer uh, or anybody is even interested in how you got to the answer. And what about other things in modern life? Aren't we now more looking for things like creativity and exploring uncertainties and learning from failure? And presumably the, the school promotes that. Yeah, we are, because as as machines take on most of the tasks that uh, we needed to learn as, you know, 10,000 hour skills that you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, when machines can do those things, then uh, we naturally have uh, spare time. So if I had to spend uh, 10,000 hours learning how to uh, make a, a perfect fried egg, I no longer would need to do that if there was the perfect fried egg maker that you can get for five ninety nine, and that will make the perfect fried egg for you. So then I can spend those 10,000 hours in perhaps doing something else. Uh, now, what would we do? And sometimes people ask me this, that if machines were to take over all of the humdrum activities of life, then what would people do? If, if the machines take away all the jobs, then what we, would we do? And uh, I would reckon that we would have no choice except to do two things. One is try to answer the questions to which no one has the answer. And secondly, to create things that don't exist. It kind of gives us, I think, an uh, idea of uh, what God does 
uh, you know, generally. I think tries to figure out answers to, to things that nobody knows anything about. And then if he has some spare time, he creates stuff. So what what should we do then? Okay, let, let, let me let me attempt this, okay, to, to whoever is listening. Yeah. If, if you're a parent, then give the internet the same status in your house as the as the television set in the living room. Let it be a big screen that's visible to everybody as in a central location. Uh, do not encourage tiny devices up in the bedroom. It's as simple as that. And you'll find that the Internet suddenly from becoming uh, from, from being a villain will become a hero and will start producing really good stuff. If you are a teacher, then do not give answers. Raise questions and ask the children to find the answers if they can. That, of course, is a, is a large part of my work. And, and I can defend it very easily. Many teachers around the world have, have tried it and they would agree that uh, that's the big change in approach that one needs to take. The teacher's job is to think of the big questions as opposed to provide the answers. If you are a child uh, listening to this program, you know, turn, t- turn it off. Turn it off. You don't need any of this. Don't listen to all this gobbledygook. It's meant for older people who don't know any better. (laughs) (laughs) And if you are that older person who is listening to this just for the heck of it, then, uh, well, you know, get yourself a drink or something and uh, don't worry your head too much about it. But what if there are some people listening who feel um, enthused by what you've said and would like to um, somehow get involved in your project more. Yes, well, some practical, uh, uh, some practical uh, things to do. There is a website called theschoolinthecloud.org uh, where lots of people write blogs about their own experiences. Uh, you could join that. There is an organization called The Granny Cloud. You can Google it and they have a website. You could join that. If you work in a school, you could set up a self-organized learning environment. You can do it cheaply or you can spend a lot of money on it. It depends on how you want to do it and in what form. The schoolinthecloud.org website will tell you something about that. If you have money that you would like to invest into a school, then there are now a few organizations that I know which are uh, actualizing some of this work into environments that they create either in schools or inside communities. And finally, of course, if you have money that you would like to spend on assisting fundamental research into this kind of learning, um, you could consider giving it to me, you know. (laughs) Okay, well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much for giving up your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.